Turn it down some pool. Did you find the uh the iPad? Two. You gotta turn it down some. It's too loud. After you finish putting it on your lips, turn it down. <laughs> you ain't done rubbing it on your lips yet? Beautiful people. Happy Friday. Hey, hey, Jen, shalom, shalom. Trina, hey, girl. Hey, Kikongo, Kiku, you start 87. See me. See me. All right, beautiful people. It is Friday, February 11, 2022. It is day 28 of year four of reading through the books of the Law and the Prophets. Another four year consecutive day count. It is day 1046, 1046. Today, we are reading tablet 11 of the Lost Book of Enki. And then, if we got time, we'll pick up in chapter 20 of My Big Toe on page 144. So, let's go ahead. Tootie, that's still a little bit too loud. Turn down, Pooh. All right, y'all. A call for wholehearted commitment, the Shema, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Bella, turn it down some. Oh, you gonna go upstairs? Don't start with me first thing this morning, little girl. Joy, shalom, shalom. She about to be kicked out this kitchen first thing this morning. Turn it down a little bit. I'm gonna have to turn it down. Excuse me one second. Yeah, you want to say First thing in the morning, this little tiny lady want to try me. Not today, girl. Not today. A call for wholehearted commitment. Make sure it's turned up. Okay. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land he swore to give to you when he made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses will be richly stocked with goods you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig, and you will eat from vineyards and olive trees you did not plant. 
when you have eaten your fill in this land. Be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and serve him. When you take an oath, you must only use his name. You must not worship any of the gods of the neighboring nations. For the Lord your God who lives among you is a jealous God. His anger will flare up against you and he will wipe you from the face of the earth. You must not test the Lord your God as you did when you complained at Massa. You must diligently obey the commands of the Lord your God, all the laws and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so all will go well with you. Then you will enter and occupy the good land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. You will drive out all the enemies living in the land, just as the Lord said you would. In the future, your children will ask you, What is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations that the Lord our God has commanded us to obey? Then you must tell them, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. But the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand. The Lord did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people he brought us out of egypt so he could give us this land he has sworn to give to our ancestors and the lord our god commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear him so that he can continue to bless us and preserve our lives as he has done to this day for we will be counted as righteous when we obey all the commands the lord our god has given unto us belinda brown grand rising levon blessings blessings all right beautiful people let's get to it uncle jb grand rising The 11th Tablet, the synopsis of the 11th Tablet. The spaceport's land, Tilman, is declared a neutral zone. It is granted to Ninma, who is renamed Ninharsag. Marduk gets the dark lands, the, en en light, the Enlil lights, I'm sorry, yeah. The Enlil lights, the olden lands. Marduk's grandsons quarrel, Satu murders Asar. Impregnating herself, Asar's wife, Asta, bears Horan. In aerial battles over Tilman, Horan vanquishes Satu. The Enlilites deem it prudent to prepare another spaceport. Inki's son, Dumuzi, and Inanna, Enlil's granddaughter, fall in love. Fearing the consequences, Marduk causes Dumuzi's death. Seeking his body, Inanna is put to death, then resurrected. Inanna launches a war zone to seize and punish Marduk. The Enlil lights break into his hideaway in the Great Mount. They seal the uppermost chamber to entomb Marduk alive. Marduk's wife, Sarpanit, and his son, Nabu, plead for his life. Ningishida, knowing the Mount's secrets, reaches Marduk. Marduk, his life spared, goes into exile. Inki and Enlil divide the earth among their other sons. And here's a picture which we figured out yesterday. What they were building were the pyramids, or what we call the pyramids. Right, Yahoo is one. Oh, great spirit, search your hearts and minds so that we are filled with your spirit. Hallelujah. All right, y'all. 11 tablet praise to ning harsag on earth the peacemaker in unison the anunnaki proclaim during the first shar after the deluge nin harsag to cool down tempers managed nibiru with gold to resupply was over ambitious and rivalries paramount slowly the earth to team with life return with the seeds of life by inky preserved what by itself survived was augmented on land and in their air and waters. Most of all, I'm sorry, most precious of all, the Anunnaki discovered were mankind's own remnants. As in bygone days, when the primitive workers were created, the Anunnaki, few and strained for civilized workers, now clamored. By the time the first shard after the deluge was completed, the peaceful truce by an unexpected occurrence was shattered. Not between, the Mar not between Marduk and Inerta, not between en Inki and Enlil clans was the eruption. Between Marduk's own sons, by the Ejiji abetted, was tranquility broken. When Marduk and Sarpanit and their sons and daughters on Lamu, the deluge outweighed the two sons, Asar and Satu, to the daughters of Shamgaz, the Ejiji leader, a liking took. When to earth they all returned, the two brothers, the two, hold on. When, when to earth they all returned, 
the two brothers, the two sisters, the spouse. Asar, the one called Asata, chose Satu, the one called Nebat, betrothed. Asar, with his father Marduk, in the dark-hued lands to abide, chose Satu, near the landing place where the Ijiji dwelt with Shamgaz, his dwelling made. About the domains on earth with Shamgaz concerned, where shall the Ijiji, the masters, be? So did Shamgaz, the other Ijiji, in sight of that Nebat to Satu, daily spoke. By staying with his father, Asar, the successor alone, shall be the fertile lands he will inherit. So did Shamgaz to his daughter, Nebat to Satu, day after day, say, how the succession in the lands, I'm sorry, how the succession in the hands of Satu alone to retain father and daughter schemed. On an auspicious day, they made a banquet. Ijiji and Anunnaki to it, they invited. Asar, unexpecting to celebrate with his brother, also came. Nebat, his spouse's sister, prepared the tables, footstools she also set. She beautified herself with lyre in the hand. She beautified herself with lyre in hand, a song to mighty Asar she sang. Satu, before him, chose choice roast meat cut with salted knife for him, fatlings he served. Shamgaz in a large goblet, new wine to Asar offered, an add mixture for him he made, a large vessel, mighty to look upon, with elixir wine he gave him. In good humor was Asar. Merrily he arose and sang, with cymbals in his hand he chanted. Then by the add mixture wine he was overcome, to the ground he fell down. Let us for a sound sleep take him, the host to the others at the banquet said. They, Asar, to another chamber carried, and a coffin they laid him. The coffin, with tight seals they closed, into the sea they threw it. When word of what had happened, Asata reached, hold on. When word of what had happened, Asata reached. To Marduk, her husband's father, she raised a wailing. Asar to his death in the sea depths was brutally thrown. Quickly must the coffin be found. They searched the sea for Asar's coffin by the shores of the dark-hued land it was found. Inside the stiff body of Asar lay, from its nostrils the breath of life departed. Marduk, his clothes rent, on his forehead he put ashes. My son, my son, Sarpanic cried and wept. Great were her grief and mourning. Inky was distraught and wept. The curse of Cain is repeated to his son in agony, he said. Asada to high heavens, a wailing raised. To Marduk for revenge and an heir and appeal she made. Satu, his death must meet. By your own seed, a successor, let me conceive. Let by your name, his name, remembered be the lineage surviving. This, alas, cannot be done. Inky to Marduk and Asada said, The brother who killed, the brother's brother, must be the keeper. For this Satu must be spared. By his seed and heir to Asar, you must conceive. By these twists of fate, As Asta, what am I calling him? Asada, I'm calling him Asada, it's Asta. Let me get my words together. By these twists of fate, Asta was baffled, distraught, the rule to defy, she was determined. Before the body of Asar was wrapped and in the shroud in a shrine preserved. From his phallus, Asta, the seed, I'm sorry. From his phallus, Asta, the life seed of Asar, extracted. With it, Asta herself made conceive an heir and avenger to Asar to be born. To Enki and his sons, to Marduk and his brothers, Satu word delivered. Now, I could be wrong. Mom, shalom, shalom. But this right here, how she impregnated herself, that's, that's sounding a little nimrod to me. I'm just saying. Not too much, but how he died. Well, not necessarily how he died, right? But let me keep reading. Cause, hold on. <laughs> Make sure I say this. So if you go back and read about Nimrod, when he was killed, his they said it was his mama, but it was his wife. So remember that video, his mama wife? 
that's in a title somewhere of the video when we did it's a few videos because we read about nimrod for like a couple days especially when we was going through um the legends of the jews but when he died she said that she was impregnated by him now it didn't say exactly how she got his seed into her body but when i read this that's what it reminded me of okay the sole heir and marduk's successor am i of the land of the two narrows i will be the master before the Anunnaki's council, Asta, the claim refuted, with Asar's heir, I am with child. Among the river's bulrushes, with a child she hid, the wrath of Satu she was avoiding. Horan, she called the boy. Haru, yeah, that's probably where this story, they got that, yeah, this is probably this, right? Yeah, Nimrod. Um, I forget her name now, but in Egyptian mythology, the son that is born from this particular type of thing is uh, called Haru, right? Okay, I'm going to keep reading. Before the Anunnaki's council, Asta, the claim refuted, with Asar's heir, I am with child. Among the river's bull rushes, with the child she hid, the wrath of Satu she was avoiding. Haran, she called the boy, to be his father's avenger, she raised him. Satu, by this, was disconcerted. Sham gas from ambitions did not retreat. From earth year to earth year, the Ejiji and their offspring from the landing place spread unto the borders of Tilman, Ningharsag's sacred region, closer they moved to overrun the place of the celestial chariots, the Ejiji and their earthlings threatened. In the dark-hued lands, the child Horan, by earth's quick life cycles, to a hero grew. By his great uncle Gibil was Horan was Horan adopted. By him he was trained and instructed. For him, Gibal winged sandals for soaring fashion. To fly like a falcon he was able. For him, Gibal, a divine harpoon made, its arrows, bolts of missiles were. In the highlands of the south did him Gibal the arts of metals and smithing teach. The secret of a metal called iron gibble to haran revealed from it weapons haran made from loyal earthlings an army he raised the set the challenge satu and the egg i'm sorry to challenge satu and the egg northward across land and river they marched when haran and his earthlings army the border of tilman the land of the missiles reached satu to haran words of challenge sent between us two alone is the conflict. Let us one-on-one -on -one in contest meet. In the skies above Tilman, Satu in his whirlwind for combat, Horan awaited. When Horan toward him like a falcon skyward sword, a poisoned dart at him Satu shot like a scorpion's sting, it Horan failed. When Asta saw this, a cry to heaven she sent forth. For Ningishida, she cried out. From his celestial boat, Ningishida came down to save the hero for his mother he came. With magic powers, Ningishida, the poison to benevolent blood, converted. By morning, Haran was healed. From the dead, he was returned. Then, with a fiery pillar, like a heavenly fish with fins and a fiery tail, Ningish Zeta to Haran provided. Its eyes from blue to red to blue, their colors changed. Toward the triumphant Satu, Haran and the fiery pillar soared. Far and wide, each other they chased. Fierce and deadly was the battle. At first, Haran's fiery pillar was hit. Then with his harpoon, Haran Satu smote. To the ground, Satu crashing came down. By Haran and tethers, he was bound. When before the council, Haran with his captive uncle came, they saw that he was blinded, his testicles squashed like a discarded jar he stood. Let Satu, blind and airless, live, so did Asa to the council say, to end his days as a mortal among the EGG, the council his fate determined. Triumphant was Haran declared, the throne of his father to inherit, on a metal table was the council's decision inscribed in the hall of records they placed it. In his abode, Marduk with the decision was pleased. By what had happened, he was sorrowed. Though Haran, a son of Asar, 
his son was from Shamgaz the Ejiji, he was descended. A domain, one as among the Anunnaki allocated to him, was not given. Having lost both sons and each other, Marduk and Sarpanet, Solus sought. In time to them, another son was born, Nabu, prophecy bearer, they named him. Now this is the account of why in the far away a new chariot's place was built and the love of Demuzi and Inanna that Marduk by Demuzi's death disrupted. It was after the contesting of Haran and Satu and their aerial battle over Tillman that Enlil, his three sons, to a council summoned. With concern to them of what was happening, he said, in the beginning, the earthlings in our image and after our likeness we made. Now the Anunnaki offspring in the images and likeness of the earthlings became. Then it was Cain who his brother killed. Now a son of Marduk is his brother's killed. Yeah, is his brother's. I'm sorry. Let me read that again. I said that wrong. Then it was Cain who his brother killed. Now a son of Marduk is his brother's killer. For the first time ever, an Anunnaki offspring from earthlings, an army raised. Weapons from a metal of the Anunnaki, a secret in their hands he placed. From the days when by Alalu and Anzu our legitimacy was challenged, disruption and rule breaking by the Ejiji continued. Now the beacon peaks in the domain of Marduk are located. The landing place by the Ejiji is held. Remember, the beacon peaks are the pyramids. Now toward the place of the chariots, the Ejiji are advancing. In the name of Satu, to all the heaven-earth facilities they claim will lay. So did Enlil to his three sons say, to take counter steps to them he proposed. An alternative heaven-earth facility in secret established we must. Let it in the Nertus land beyond the oceans, in the midst of trusted earthlings, come to be. Thus was the secret mission in the hands of Ninurta entrusted. In the mountain lands beyond the oceans, beside the great lake, a new bond, heaven earth, he was setting up. Within an enclosure, he placed it. At the foot of the mountains where the gold nuggets were scattered, a plain with firm ground he chose. On it for ascent and descent markings he made. Primitive are the facilities, but the purpose they will serve. So did Ninurta to his father Enlil in good time declare. From there, gold shipments to Nibiru can continue. From there, in need, we too can ascend. At that time, what as a blessed event began as a horrible occurrence ended. At that time, Demuzi, Inki's youngest son to Inanna, Nanar's daughter, a liking took. And Nana, Enlil's granddaughter, by the Lord of Herding, was captivated. A love that knows no bounds engulfed them, a passion their hearts inflamed. Many of the love songs for that a long time thereafter were sung, and Nana and Demuzi were the first to sing them by song their love they recounted. To Demuzi, his youngest son, Inki, a large domain above the Abzu allotted. Mahula, the black land, was its name. Highland trees there grew, its waters abundant were. Large bulls among its rivers, reeds roamed, greatly numbered were its cattle. Silver from its mountains came, its copper bright as gold was a glitter. Greatly beloved was Demuzi by Enki after the death of Asar, he was favored. Of his youngest brother, Marduk was jealous. Inanna by her parents, Nenar and Ningal was beloved. Enlil by her cradle sat, beautiful beyond describing she was, in merit I'm sorry, in martial arts with Anunnaki heroes she competed. Of journeys in the heavens and of celestial boats from her brother Utu she learned, a skyship of her own to roam in earth skies to her the Anunnaki presented. After the deluge on the landing platform, Demuzi and Inanna, their eyes on each other set. At the dedication of the artifice mounts was between them a warm encounter. Hesitant at first they were, he of Inki's clan, she of Enlil and offspring. When in Harshag for peace the disputing clans together bought, and Nana and Demuzi away from the others to be together managed. Love to each other they professed. 
As they went strolling together, sweet words of alluring love to each other, they said. Side by side, they lay down. One heart with the other chatted. Around her waist, the moozy put his arm like a wild bull to take her, he wished. Let me teach you, let me teach you, to Inanna, the moozy said. Gently, she kissed him. Then to him of her mother, she spoke. What fib could I tell my mother? What words will you tell Ningal? Let us of our love, my mother, tell of joy cedar perfume she will on us sprinkle. To the dwelling place of Ningal, Inanna's mother, the lovers went. To them, Ningal, her blessing gave, of Demuzi, the mother of Inanna, approved. Lord Demuzi, as a son-in-law of Nanar, you are worthy, to him she said. Demuzi, as a bridegroom by Nanar, himself was welcomed. Inanna's brother Utu, let it be so, said. Perchance the espousing peace between the clans truly will bring. Enlil to them all said, when of the love and betrothal of Demuzi, to his father and brother spoke, Enki of peace through espousal also was thinking his blessings to Demuzi he gave. Demuzi's brothers, all except Marduk, about the espousal were joyful. A betrothal bed of gold by Gibble was fashioned. Nergal, blue hue, lapis, stones, scent. Sweet dates, a fruit by Inanna favored. Beside the bed, they in a pile placed. Under the fruits of the beds of lapis, they hid for Inanna to discover. As the custom was to perfume and clothe Inanna, a sister of Dumuzi, sent Gishtina, what? Gish, Gishtiana. Hold on. Gishtiana. Okay. Gishtiana, a sister-in-law to be, was her name. To her, Inanna, what was in her heart revealed of her future with Dumuzi to her, she said, a vision of a great nation I have, as a great Anunnaki, the Muzi, there will rise. His name over others shall be exalted. His queen's spouse I shall be. Princely, princely status we will share. Rebellious countries we shall together subdue. To the Muzi I will status give. The country I will rightly direct. Inanna's vision of rulership and glory by Gishtiana to her brother Marduk were reported. By Inanna's ambitions, Marduk was greatly disturbed. To Gishtiana, a secret plan, he told, Boy, Marduk just ain't gonna get with the program, is he? Well, I mean, I guess. He has been slighted. I mean, not on purpose, but I mean, I feel him. That's what I said yesterday, Francis, the Merkaba ship or chariot of flame, right? Shalom, shalom. I think, I personally think that's what it is. I think it's the Merkaba, right? Whether it's a whirlwind or it's a fire, I think it's a Merkaba. Based on my studies and what I know, that's what I think it is. By Inanna's ambitions, Marduk was greatly disturbed to Gishtiana a secret plan, he told. To her brother Demuzi, to the herder's dwelling, Gishtiana went. Lovely to behold and perfume to her brother Demuzi. Thus she said, Before with your young wife in your embrace with you will sleep. A legitimate heir by, by a sister born you must have. Inanna's son to succession shall not be entitled. On your mother's knees he will not be raised. She put her hand in his hand. She pressed her body against his body. My brother with you I will lie down. This heifer. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse my French. <laughs> Hold on. Let me go back. Boy, I tell you, you can't share good news with nobody coming after your man. Hold on. Let me make sure I'm reading this right. Kiss Tiana. Yes, yeah, sister in law. Hold on. Yeah, let me go back up. Okay. Yes, baby. Guess what? What? You know that you know that thing to my um, for hot tag. Guess what? What? Dad said we can go again. We can go again. Okay. Well, we gotta wait for that project to come up. It'll be pretty soon. We're going to the hotel again. Okay. No. Yes. You going right now? We're going right now. I need to verify that with Dad. Okay. Okay, is that okay with you? But I think that's next weekend. 
I'm talking to that. I'm talking to that, sis. Don't. <laughs> that's not that. Mom, look. look okay. Dad, don't say that one. Dad only say yes when you can go. Okay. I'm going to talk to Dad in a few minutes. Okay. Mom, you don't. Oh, you don't want me to talk to Dad. You just want to go. <laughs> look. Okay. In Nana's visions of rulership and glory by Gish Tiana to her brother Marduk were reported. Yeah, they... Yeah, they like to go to the hotel because um, they like to go to their pool. So that's what that's where she really want to go. She didn't pack her bag and everything, girl. By yeah, Inanna's ambitions, Marduk was greatly disturbed to give Tiana a secret plan he told to her brother Demuzi to the herder's dwelling. Gish Tiana went. Oh, Lovely. Th Ooh, girl, did they just spill all on the floor? Oh my gosh. Girl, watermelon is everywhere. Don't worry about it. Throw it all in the trash. I got another one. Just, yeah. I'll get the next one. Just put all that in the trash. The whole bowl of watermelon just psh, all over the kitchen floor. Let me finish reading this. By Inanna's ambitions, Marduk was greatly disturbed to give Tiana a secret plan he told. To her brother Demuzi, to the herder's dwelling, Gish Tiana went, lovely to behold and perfume, to her brother Demuzi, thus she said, before with your young wife in your embrace, with you will sleep, a legitimate heir by a sister born you must have. She said, look, before you tie the knot with sis, you need to go ahead and get this together, right? She said, I'm right here. We can do this right now. <sighs> a legitimate heir by a sister born you must have. Inanna's son to succession shall not be entitled. On your mother's knees, he will not be raised. She put her hand in his hand. She put his hand in her hand. She pressed her body against his body. My brother, with you, I will lie down. Bridegroom, with you, a peer of Inky, we shall have. So did Gishtiana to Demuzi whisper, a noble issue, a noble, a noble issue. From her womb to half. Boy, I tell you. Look, I'm about to say something about him. Bruh, how could you let yourself be overtaken by this? Five second rule, Trina. Not with watermelon on the kitchen floor. Yeah, baby. Maybe M&M's or something like that. <laughs> but not with watermelon. Mm -mm. M&M's, you can kiss it up to God and eat it. <laughs> But not with wet watermelon. Mm-mm. 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 That's all got to go in the trash. Don't think any less of me. Don't act like y'all ain't never. Well, some of y'all may not have, but look. <laughs> I didn't ate off the floor before when I was young. And possibly a few times when I was older. But they was only M&M's, though. No, I'm joking. No, I'm really being serious. <laughs> but I promise you, there was only M&M's. And it didn't fall on the hard floor. Maybe on the carpet in my bedroom. I trust my bedroom no. floor. Okay, give me, hold on to you. Look, give me this one. Hold on, y'all. Give me that. Get a bowl. Okay. Get a bowl. Get a bowl. Huh. Oh, we got a plate and said, okay. Yeah, this, this, this girl. No. Go ahead, go ahead. You can do it. Just don't mop that over. You got it? Okay, boom. All right, let me go back here. Look. My brother, with you I will lie down. Bridegroom, with you a pair of inky we shall have. So did Gishtiana to Demuzi whisper a noble issue from her womb to have. Into her womb, Demuzi poured the semen. By her caressing, he fell asleep. And not only this, but you didn't just like hurry up and get done. You done laid him, went to sleep while your wife-to-be is probably on her way to see you. Boy, I tell you. Let me read this again. My brother, with you I will lie down. Bridegroom, with you a peer of inky we shall have. So did Gishtiana to Demuzi whisper, a noble issue from her womb to have. Into her womb, Demuzi poured the semen. By her caressing, he fell asleep. During the night, Demuzi had a dream, a premonition of death he envisioned. In the dream, seven evil bandits he saw coming into his dwelling. The master has sent us for you, son of Dutur. To him they said, 
They chased away his ewes, his lambs, and kids. They drove away the headdress of lordship. They took off his head, the royal robe off his body. They tore the staff of shepherding. They took and broke his cup from its peg. They threw down naked and barefoot. They seized him in fetters. They his hands bound in the name of the princely bird and the falcon. They left him dying. Disturbed and startled in the middle of the night. I'm sorry. Disturbed and startled. The Muzi in the middle of the night awoke to Gishtiana the dream he told. The dream is not favorable. Gishtiana to the distraught the Muzi said. Marduk of raping me will accuse you. Evil emissaries to arrest you. He will send to try you and disgrace you. He will order the liaison with an Enlil light to, disun to disunite. As a wounded beast, the Muzi, a cry roared out, betrayal, betrayal. He shouted, you should have thought about that before you poured your cup of elixir into her bowl. <laughs> My daughter. To Utu, Inanna's brother, help me, word he sent. The name of his father, Inki, a talisman, he uttered. Through the desert of Imush, the snake's desert, the Muzi rushed to escape. To the place of mighty waterfalls from the evil doers, he ran to hide, where the gushing waters of the rocks to slippery smoothness made the Muzi slip and fell. The onrushing waters of his lifely, lifeless body and a white froth swept away. Sheesh. For a moment of pleasure and possible rulership, boy, you just lost your life. Now, this is the account of Inanna's descent to the Lord Abzu, the great and Anaki war, and how Marduk, the ink, I'm sorry, and how Marduk in the Ikur alive was imprisoned. When the lifeless body of the Muzi from the Great Lakes waters by Ningal was retrieved to the abode of Nergal and Ereshkigal, and the Lord Abzu, the body was bought. On a stone slab was the dead body of Dumuzi, a son of Enki place. When of what had happened, word to Enki was sent. Enki rent his clothes. On his forehead, he put ashes. My son, my son, for Dumuzi, he lamented. What have I sinned to be, hold on. What have I sinned to be so punished? Out loud, he asked. When I to earth from Nibiru came, Ia, whose, he whose home is waters, was my name with waters did the celestial chariots obtain their thrust power in waters i splashed down then by an avalanche of waters the earth was swept over in waters did asar my grandchild drown by waters my beloved muzi is now dead everything i had done for righteous purpose did i do it why am i punished why has fate against me so turned? So did Enki bewail and lament. When from Gishtiana the veracity of occurrences was discovered, greater was Enki's agony. Now Marduk, my firstborn for his deed, will also suffer. By the disappearance of I'm sorry, by the disappearance and death of Dumuzi was Inanna worried, then grieved. Then to the Lord Abzu she hurried, Dumuzi's body for burial to retrieve. When er when Ereshkigal, her sister, of the arrival of Inanna at the precinct's gate was told, Ereshkigal, a devious scheme on the part of Inanna suspected. At each of the seven gates, one of Inanna's accoutrements and weapons was from her removed, then unclothed and powerless before Ereshkigal's throne of scheming, an heir by Nergal, Dumuzi's brother, she was accused. Trembling with fury, Ereshkigal to her sister's explanations would not listen. Let loose against her the sixty diseases, Ereshkigal, her vizier, Nat Namtar, in anger ordered. By the disappearance of Inanna and the Lord Abzu were her parents much worried. Nenar to Enlil and the matter went. Enlil to Enki, a message sent out. I mean, that sounds horrible. Let loose against her the 60 diseases? How are you going to survive that? 
From Nergal, his son, Ereshkigal's spouse, Enki, what had happened, learned. From clay of the Abzu, Enki, two emissaries fashioned, beings without blood, by death raised unharmed. To the lower Abzu, he sent them, Inanna, to bring back, whether alive or dead. They didn't just fashion, I guess, what the Christian church would call demons, right? But do you know there are some magic books out there that you can that actually teach you how to form uh entities audrey shalom shalom like seriously i didn't believe it i had to get in and look at it there are actually uh concoctions and stuff that you can do and create entities to help you to do stuff it's amazing some of the stuff that's out there. And it makes me think about a lot of different things that happen. Like I know a, a lot about a lot. And these are just pieces that come together when I wonder how different things are done. And I come across something that shows me how it's done. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. A lot of people don't think magic is real. But it definitely is. It definitely is. Matter of fact, if you pay close attention enough, you will see magic happening all through the Bible. Even with Israel. To the Lord Abzu, he sent them, and Nana to bring back whether alive or dead. When before Erishkagal they came, Erishkagal by their appearance was puzzled. Are you Anunnaki? Are you earthlings? With bewilderment, she asked them. Namtar, the magical weapons of power against them directed, but unharmed the two were. To the lifeless body of Inanna, he took them, hanging from a stake she was. Upon the corpse of clay, emissaries, a pulser, and an emitter directed. Then the water of life on her they sprinkled in her mouth, the plant of life they placed. Then Inanna stirred, her eyes she opened, from the dead Inanna arose. When the two emissaries, Inanna to the upper world, were ready to return, Inanna, the lifeless body of the Muzi, to take along them ordered. Yeah, and Nana, the lifeless body of Demuzi, to take along them ordered. At the seven gates of the Lord Abzu to Inanna, her accoutrements, her accoutrements and attributes were returned. To the abode of Demuzi in the black land, the lover of her youth, to take the emissaries she ordered. There to wash him with pure water, with sweet oil him anoint. Then to clothe him in a red shroud upon a slab of lapis lay him. Then in the rocks for him, a rest place carved out, a, the day of arising, there to await. As for herself, to the abode of Enki, Inanna set her steps. Retribution for her beloved's death she wanted, the death of Marduk, the culprit she demanded. There has been death enough, Enki to her said. Marduk an instigator was, but the murder he committed not. When Inanna learned that Marduk would not by Enki be punished, Inanna to her parents and brother went to high heaven. She is wailing raised. She, I'm sorry, to high heaven. She a wailing raised. Justice, revenge, death to Marduk. She cried for. At Enlil's abode, his sons Inanna and Utu joined for a council of war. They gathered. Ninurta, whom the rebel Anzu defeated for strong measures, argued. Of secret words between Marduk and the Ejiji exchanged, Utu to them reported. Of Marduk, an evil serpent, earth must be rid. Enlil with them agreed. When the demand for Marduk's surrender to Enki, his father was sent. Enki to his abode, Marduk and all the other sons summoned. Though for my beloved Muzi, I am still grieving. Marduk's rights I must defend. Though evil did Marduk instigate by ill fate, not by Marduk's hand did the Muzi die. Marduk is my firstborn. Ninki is his mother. For succession he is destined. From death by Ninurta's gang, by us all, he must be protected. So did Inki say. Only Gibbo and Ninagal, their father's call heeded. Ningish Zeta was opposed. Nurgle was hesitant. Only if in mortal danger he will be, will I help, he said. It was after that that a war of ferocity unknown between the two clans erupted. 
Unlike the contending of Haran and Satu of earthlings descended, it was a battle between the Anunnaki Niburian born among them on another planet was loosed. By Inanna was the warfare begun. In her sky ship to the domains of Inky sons, she crossed over. Marduk to the battle she challenged. To the domains of Ninagal and Gibbo she pursued. To assist her, Ninurta from his storm bird, withering beams at the enemy's strongholds shot. Ishkur from the skies with scorching lightnings and smashing thunders attacked. In the Abzu, from the rivers, fish he washed away, cattle in the fields he dispersed. To the north, the place of the artifice mounts, Marduk then retreated. Pursuing him, Ninurta on the habitations, poison-bearing missiles rained. His weapons that tears, hold on. His weapon that tears apart the people in those lands robbed of their senses. The canals that the river's waters bore, red from blood, became Ishkur's brilliance, the night's darkness into flaming days converted. As the devastating battles northward advanced, Marduk and, in, and the Inkur himself is sconed. Gibble, for it an unseen shield devised, Nurgle to heaven, its all-seeing eye raised. With a weapon of brilliance, by a horn directed, Inanna, the hiding place, attacked. Haran to defend his grandfather came. By her brilliance was his right eye damaged. While Utu, the Ijiji, and their horde of earthlings beyond Tillman held off at the foot of the artifice mounts, Anunnaki, this and that clan supporting, in battle clashed. Let Marduk surrender. Let the blood shed in, so did Enlil to Enki words convey. Let brother talk to brother, to Enki, Ning Harshag, a message sent. In his hideout, within the Incur, Marduk, his pursuers to defy, continued. Within the house, which like a mountain, is his final stand. I'm sorry. Within the house, within the house, which is like a mountain, is... His final stand he made. Inanna, the massive stone structure, could not surmount its smooth sides. Her weapons deflected. Then the nurta of the secret entrance learned. Who was that yesterday that said they had the secret entrances? Trina. They don't know how to get into them janks. Then the nurta of the secret entrance learned the swivel stone on the north side he found. Through a dark corridor, Ninurta passed the grand gallery he reached. Its vault by the many-hued emissions of the crystals like a rainbow was a glitter. Inside, by the intrusion alerted, Marduk with ready weapons, Ninurta awaited. With weapons responding, smashing the wonder crystals, Ninurta up the gallery kept going. Into the upper chamber... The place of the great pulsating stone, Marduk retreated. At its entrance, Marduk, the sliding stone, locks lowered. From one and all admission, they barred. Into the Ikur, Inanna, and Ishkur, Ninurta follow. What next to do, they contemplated. Let the encased hiding chamber be Marduk's stone coffin, to them, Ishkur said. To three blocking stones, ready for down gliding. Ishkur, their attention drew. Let slow death by a lie being buried be Marduk's sentence. And Nana, her consent gave. At the end of the gallery, the three, the blocking stones, let loose. Each one of them, one stone for plugging, slid down. Marduk as in a tomb to seal. Let's see how much more we got. Oh, yeah. What is seven minutes? We only got a few more pages. And y'all, we almost done with this. It's only 14 tablets. Is it 14? Make sure I got it right. Yeah, 14 tablets. And a 14 tablet is only like a couple pages. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I'm debating on which one we're going to start next. I'll let y'all, I'll let y'all know in a couple days. Or what the running, the running, the 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 two runner ups are. 
but it's some more tablets definitely believe that it's some more tablets we got it here okay now this is the account of how marduk was saved and to exile departed and how the ink the ikur was dismantled and lordship over the lands rearranged away from the sun and light without food or water marduk within the ikur alive was entombed by his imprisonment and punishment without trial Sarpanet, his spouse, a wailing raise. To Inki, her father-in-law, she harried. With the young son, Nabu, to him she came. To be among the living, Marduk must be returned. To Inki, Sarpanet said. He sent her to Utu and Nanar, who with Inanna can intercede. Wearing a garment of atonement. To the Lord Marduk, give life, she pleaded. Let him humbly life continue. Rulership he will lay aside. Appease was not Inanna. For the death of my beloved, the instigator must die, Inanna retorted. Ninghar said, the peacemaker, the brothers Inki and Enlil summoned. Punishment to Marduk must come. Death is not warranted to them, she said. Let Marduk in exile live. The succession on earth to Ninurta submit. Enlil by her words was pleased and smiled. Ninurta was his son. Of Ninurta, she was the mother. If between succession and life the choice is, what can I, a father, say? So did Enki with a heavy heart answer. In my lands, widespread is desolation. Warfare must end. For Demuzi, I am still in mourning. Let Marduk live in exile. If peace is to be returned and Marduk shall live, binding arrangements must be made. Enlil to Enki said, all facilities that heaven and earth bond to my hands alone must be entrusted. <clears throat> the mastery over the land of the two narrows to another son of yours you must give. The Ejiji who Marduk follow, the landing place must give up and abandon. To the land of no return by no descendant of Zia Sudra inhabited must Marduk in exile go. So did Enlil forcefully declare to be foremost among the brothers he met. The hand of fate, Inky in his heart acknowledged, let it so be, with a bowed head, he said, Ningish Zeta alone, the, hold on, Ningish Zeta alone, the Ikur entered, no, let him over its land the master be. After the decision by the great Anunnaki were announced, Ningish Zeta for the rescue they summoned. How Marduk from the block and seal innards to extricate was his challenge. To let free the one who was alive is buried, a task beyond conceiving to him they gave. Ningish Zeta, the Ikur's secret design, contemplated how to circumvent the blockings he planned. Through a chiseled upper opening, Marduk will be rescued to the leaders, he said. At a place which I shall show them, a doorway in the stones they will cut. From it upward, a twisting passageway they shall bore, a rescue shaft creating. Through hidden hollowings to the Ikur's midst, they will continue. At the vortex of the hollowings, through the stones they will break through. A doorway to the insides they will blow open, thereby the blockings circumventing. Up the grand gallery they will continue. The three stone bars they will raise. The utmost chamber, Marduk's death prison, they will reach. Anunnaki, by Ningish Zeta, guided his outlined plan, then followed. With tools that cracked the stones, the opening they made, the rescue shaft they fashioned. The insides of the artifice mount they reached, an exit they blew open. Circumventing the three blocking stones, the uppermost chamber they reached on a small platform, the port cullises they raised, Marduk fainted, they rescued. Carefully through the twisting shaft, they the Lord lowered to fresh air they him bought. Outside, Serpani and Nabu, spouse and father, were awaiting. A joyful reunion it was. When to Marduk, his father Inky, the terms of release conveyed, Marduk was enraged. Of course you are. It just seems to go from bad to worse for Marduk. He ain't never going to get a region of rule. And he keep making it worse for himself, thinking that he's going to make it better. But it has the opposite effect. He keeps every place he was supposed to rule, somebody else is put over him. Right? 
Marduk was angered. Marduk was humbled. To fate I yield, he inaudibly said. No, I'm sorry. I missed the whole sentence. When Marduk, his father, Enki, the terms of release conveyed, Marduk was enraged. I would rather die than my birthright forfeit, he shouted. Sarpani into his arms, Nabu thrust. We are part of your future, she said softly. Marduk was angered. Marduk was humbled. To fate I yield, he inaudibly said. With Sarpani and, Mar and Nabu to a land of no return, he departed. To a place where horned beasts are hunted with wife and son, he went. After Marduk had departed, Ninurta the Ikur through the shaft re-entered. Through a horizontal corridor to the Ikur's vulva, he went. In its east wall, in a niche artfully fashioned, the destiny stone, a red radiance, was emitting. Its power to kill me grabs. With a killing track, it me seizes. Ninurta inside the chamber cried, take it away. To obliteration, destroy it. To his lieutenants, Ninurta shouted, retracing his steps. Through the grand gallery to the topmost chamber, Ninurta went. In a hollowed out chest, the heart of the Ikur pulsated. Its net force by five compartments was enhanced. With his baton, Ninurta, the stone chest struck. With a resonating sound, it responded. Its gug stone, that directions determined, Ninurta ordered to be taken out to a place of his choice carried. Coming down the Grand Gallery, Ninurta, the 27 pairs of Nibiru crystals examined. Many in his fight with Marduk were damaged. Some, the struggle, still intact, survived. To remove the whole ones from their grooves, Ninurta ordered. The others with his beam, he pulverized. Outside the house, which like a mountain is, Ninurta in his blackbird sword, to the apex stone, his attention he turned, his enemy's epitome it represented. With his weapons, he shook it loose, to the ground in pieces it toppled. By this, the fear of Marduk is forever ended, Ninurta victorious declared. On the battleground, the assembled Anunnaki, the praise of Ninurta announced, like Anu, you are made. To their hero and leader, they shouted. To replace the incapacitated beacon, a mount near the place of the celestial chariots was chosen. With its innards, the salvage crystals were rearranged. Yeah, that sounds kind of sound like that, doesn't it, Francis? Within its innards, the salvage crystals were rearranged. Upon its peak, the gug stone, the stone of directing, was installed. Mount Mashu, mount of the supreme celestial bark, the mount was called. At that time, Enlil, his three sons, summoned Ninlil and Ninharsag, and Ninharsag also attended. Commands over olden lands to confirm, lordship over new lands to assign, they met. To Ninurta, who Anzu and Marduk had vanquished, the Enlil ship powers were granted. In all the lands, his father's surrogate to be. Of the landing place in the Cedar Mountains, lordship to Ishkur was granted. To his domain northward, thereof was the landing place joined. The lands south and east thereof, where the Ejiji and their offspring had spread, to Nanar as an everlasting endowment were given by his descendants and followers to keep and to hold. The peninsula wherein the place of the chariot was and Nanar and Nanar's lands was included. Utu, as commander of the place and the navel of the earth, was confirmed, and the land of the two narrows, as agreed, Enki to Ningish Zeta, the lordship did assign. To that, none of Enki's other sons objected. To that, Inanna was opposed. To the heritage of Dimuzi, her deceased bridegroom, did Inanna claim lay. A demand of her own, she of Enki and Enlil demanded. How Inanna's demands to satisfy the leaders contemplated about the lands and the peoples, the great Anunnaki, who the fates decree council took. Regarding the earth and its resettling words with Anu, they exchanged. From the time of the deluge, the great calamity, 
Almost two shards have passed. The earthlings have proliferated from the mountain lands to dry lowlands they went. Of civilized mankind by Zia Sudra, there were descendants with Anunnaki seed. They were intermixed. Noah's children were intermixed with the Anunnaki seed. Offspring of Ijiji who intermarried, roamed about in the distant lands, Cain's kinfolk survived. Few and lofty were the Anunnaki who from Nibiru had come. Few were their perfect descendants. How settlements for themselves and for earthlings to establish the great Anunnaki considered. How over mankind, lofty to remain, how to make the many, the few obey and serve. About all that, about the future leaders with Anu, words exchanged. To come to earth one more time, Anu decided with Antu, his spouse, he wished to come. And that is the end of tablet number 11. Where we at? 59 minutes. Okay, we got a few minutes. All right, so we're going to hop right into my big toe on page 144. Yeah, we'll be done with the Lost Book of Inky in three days, y'all. So, Monday will be our last day. Okay. My Big Toe, page 144. We stopped after that little short aside where he was explaining... what paranormal is paranormal um yeah what what was once defined defined as paranormal becomes a normal part of a larger scientific understanding that answers to a higher more general level of causality okay he was talking about pretty much what i said they kind of summed it up yesterday when people don't understand certain things they call it magic or paranormal but there is most of the time an explanation and scientific have you for most of it right whether we find out that it's actually otherworldly entities but there is an explanation for it is what they found out okay we pick up after this little short aside that they um have in here which is in the middle of the page of 144 Normal events and interactions with non-matter, non-physical matter reality. Remember, non-physical matter reality is the spirit realm, right? Physical matter reality is the world where we live at right now. Here you can see me, all that. We're physical matter reality. Normal events and interactions within non-physical matter reality must take place within the constraints of a uniform causality. There is well-defined action and reaction and similar processes must consistently produce similar results for all experimenters. The major difference between the causality that is local to and defines science in non-physical matter reality and the causality that is local to and defines science in physical matter reality is that within non-physical matter reality the range of possible causes is far less restricted. Physical matter reality and its causality is a subset of non-physical matter reality and is and its causality. So what's happening here is what's happening in the spiritual realm, so to speak, right? What we see manifested here has already manifested in the spiritual realm. That's how I kind of sum that up. MP, good morning. Oh, you know what? I, well, I did mention it before. So I'm thinking it's going to be either the Anunnaki Bible or um, either the Anunnaki Bible, the Wars of Gods and Men, or um, it's going to probably be between them two. I was, I was possibly thinking about the 12th planet. Possibly. But I don't know yet. I haven't gotten through that one just yet but it might be i'm i'm more leaning towards the anunnaki bible um 
I, I think that's what it's going to be. I think it's going to be the Anunnaki Bible. That's what I was really leaning towards because it's a combination of a whole bunch of other tablets that's been combined in here. And I think I think it actually might be a good, um, th this is a good segue into that because the first tablet in the Anunnaki Bible is given more details about um, that we've already, that we're already familiar with from the Lost Book of Inky. Now that I've, you know, I've kind of gone through it a little bit. So let's just, let's just, let's just make it that one. It's going to be the Anunnaki Bible. And I forget the author. I'll put the link. I got it from Amazon. I think it was like $20. Yeah. So we're going to read the Anunnaki Bible next, y'all. So, and I showed it to y'all before. I got it. It's upstairs. I'll run and get it so you can see the picture of it. Um, just in case you, uh, trying to order it today. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to be the Anunnaki Bible. All right. The rules that govern non-physical matter reality physics and the interactions between non-physical matter reality beings are of a higher order, more general, less restrictive. Thus, non-physical matter reality can interact with physical matter reality in ways that violate physical matter reality's causality. Such an interaction may produce paranormal activity from the viewpoint of physical matter reality, yet maintain non-physical matter reality's own causality. So if we interact, if we here in the physical realm interact with the spiritual realm, it would seem to us to be out of our realm of understanding. We don't know what's going on. Is this magic? Is this the demonic? Whatever. From our standpoint, being in a physical matter reality, we got all these questions. But if we're looking at it from the non-physical matter reality, it's just something normal, right? If we're looking at it from the spiritual realm, this is a normal part of this realm. I know you don't quite understand it over here, but we're trying to bring you up to speed, right? You're welcome, MP. Stepping up a level beyond non-physical matter reality also possesses its own unique causality and interactions that take place there must conform to a higher order of less, a higher order of less restrictive rules. Similarly, beyond non-physical matter reality can interact with non-physical, hold on, wait, I went back up, I'm sorry. Simply beyond, simply beyond non-physical matter reality can interact Mom. with non-physical. Yes, babe. You turn the light on in dad's room, in dad's room, in your room. No, I didn't. Okay, I just want to make sure I was reading this right because it's the same acronym over and over. Okay, okay. Similarly. Beyond non-physical matter reality can interact with non-physical matter reality in ways that violate non-physical matter reality's causality, but maintain beyond non-physical matter reality's causality, and so on and so forth as each larger dimension of existence supports and is a superset of the next one down. Okay. <clears throat> so now he's about to give a little short aside, short aside to kind of, I guess, explain what he just said. Eventually, we will come to understand that whether a reality appears to be physical or non-physical is relative to the observer. The property of being physical or non-physical is simply the result of one's perspective and has no real significance of its own. For the time being, the concepts of physical matter reality and non-physical matter reality provide a useful conceptualization of the larger reality from the perspective of a physical matter reality resident who has experienced no other reality save the physical one in which he or she is now reading this book. Okay, that's the end of the aside. From our viewpoint, physical matter reality appears to be the final downhill stop for this intercausual reality train unless one counts the fictional flat line as the next dimensional stop below us. The book, I'm sorry, I said flat line, flat land. Unless one counts the fictional flat land as the next dimensional stop below us. The book Flatland by E.A. Abbott provides a wonderful understanding of the scientific 
philosophic and social difficulties involved in perceiving higher Mom. dimensions. Mom. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anyone can easily understand the limitations of the dimensions that exist below their normal perspective at the same time. Looking upstream reveals nothing but mystical confusion. Though flatland deals only with geometric or spatial dimensions, the difficulties encountered in perceiving and understanding a dimensionality that is different from one's native percep perceptual construct are much the same. And I actually ordered this book called Flatland by E.A. Abbott. I'll also share this with you just in case you want to get it so you can get some further understanding. Um, I'm still going through it. I got to listen to it again. That's one of the ones when I first put it on, it sounded like wonk, 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 wonk. I'm like, what are you saying? I'm like, I might need to put this down so I get a little more understanding on some stuff. Because I don't know what you just said. I understood the, this, that, tomorrow. That's all I understood from this. <laughs> I got it. I don't quite understand it yet. I got to listen to it again. I bought the Audible, you know, so I got to listen to it again. Maybe I actually need to sit down and just pay attention and not be um, trying to multitask while I'm listening to it. But it sounds, from what he's explaining, I got it because it sounds interesting. But I, I think it was just me. I wasn't really paying attention. Like I said, I was cleaning while I was listening. And I, I probably really needed to focus on what was being said. Okay. Though flatland deals only with the geometric or spatial dimensions, the difficulties encounter in perceiving and understanding a dimension a dimensionality that is different from one's native perceptual construct are much the same. And here's another little short aside. The second revised edition of the book Flatland was published in 1884 by E. A. Abbott and is currently available from Princeton University Press. Also Amazon. That's why, I'm, you know, Audible. The book describes in a lighthearted and humorous manner the fundamental technical, epistemological, social, and political difficulty in expanding your awareness of reality beyond the dimensionality of your physical perceptions. If you have not yet read this book, I strongly urge you to do so. It will help you understand how the apparent logic of your reality and the anal analytic quality of your thinking process is limited by the dimensionality you believe you live in. And it is a hoot. Flatland in its entirety can be accessed online at www.gutenberg.org forward slash ebooks forward slash 201. But you can also go to Amazon. You can order the book physical hardback copy. I also believe they have it in Kindle, but I decided to get the Audible so I could get it in me a little bit faster, but I clearly need to listen to it again. Okay. And it's a real it's a real short book too. It's not that long. I want to if I remember correctly, I think it was 4 hours, right? So over this weekend, I think I'm going to try and listen to it again, like really sit down and pay attention to it cuz I cuz apparently it's going to add to our, my overall ex Standing of my big toe, you know, and I can kind of incorporate it with my personality into the reading and my understanding. And hopefully you guys will be able to do that as well. If you get it, I don't know. Let me know what y'all think about it. If you get through it before I do. Okay. And that was the end of the, little, of the shorter side about flatland. Perhaps beyond non-physical matter reality is the outermost layer or perhaps beyond beyond non-physical matter reality is outermost and we're gonna finish this we literally got a page and a half and we'll be done with the chapter 20 it was really short i will describe and discuss both in great detail later as well as explain what dimensionality actually is and how it is generated hold on to these thoughts we will pick up this discussion we will pick this discussion back up and continue to peel the reality onion after we have more thoroughly developed the conceptual foundation required to support the construction of a big toe. Though I have not yet explained the origins and nature of dimensionality, it is not too early to discuss a few of its properties relative to casual hierarchies or reality subsystems. We see that beginnings belong to and are governed by the rules of causality of the next higher dimension. Each dimension of existence 
births and nurtures the child dimensions it spawns. A child can, but is not required to become a parent. One parent can birth many children. Each child exists within its own dimension. Dimensionality is like your family tree. It has the property of breadth as well as depth. However, in this discussion, we are only looking at depth, the creational hierarchy. From the perspective of the child, its birth beginning must appear mystical. To the parent, the process and circumstances of the child's birth are well understood and not the slightest bit mystical. From the viewpoint of the child's own logical objective, causal system, the child's reality logically requires a mystical beginning. In other words, any system of objective causality is insulated from other causal systems by the local logic through which it defines itself. Reality subsystems, each with their own local causality, <clears throat> can be likened to the software components and subroutines of a larger complex simulation, all run interdependently within the same computer as long as they have self-consistent rule sets to define their internal and external interactions. There may be relationships and interactions between causal systems, but comprehension and understanding normally flows only one direction, from the superset to the subset. The subset does not have what it takes to understand the superset. To understand the superset, one must first become a member of it. Okay, so that if that sounds like a bunch of want, 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 blah, 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 simply put, the physical can understand the spiritual until the physical becomes spiritual, right? Or you raise up your level of consciousness and awareness and understand what the spiritual is. The spiritual is like being on, remember them, we talked about the ascension to Pharaoh's throne, the 70 steps, and you can ascend no higher than the languages you knew. Each step represented a nation and its different language. And whatever step you was on, you can relate with all the other steps. So if you knew 10 languages, you could ascend Pharaoh's throne to the 10th step. Now, you couldn't communicate any higher because, first of all, you don't, own, you don't understand those languages yet. But you can communicate and be lord over, lord over, so to speak, not bully, but, you know, you can kind of rule over the nine that are under you because you've been there, you've been through them, you understand them, you know them. It is you, right? Same thing. When you're in the physical realm, but you're spiritually dense, you know nothing. Everything seems magical and mystical to you. And we're going to call it witchcraft. Stay away from it. Demonic. No, it's none of that. You just don't understand. That's simply what he just said in a nutshell. Right? Look. The subset being physical, being subset, and superset being spiritual. The subset does not have what it takes to understand the superset. To understand the superset, one must first become a member of it. If you have read Flatland, it will be clear that the ordinary residents of a given reality can only observe and understand interactions within their own reality and the interactions of residents of realities that are more highly constrained than their own. Residents of a more constrained reality cannot comprehend a less constrained reality because it lies beyond the limits of their normal perception. Each dimension of reality has its own rules that define its objective science. Additionally, each dimension of reality experiences the next higher, less limited dimension as subjective and mystical. Consequently, and that's good if you didn't catch that, as you get higher, it's less restrictive. You have way more freedom, right? But just because you have more freedom don't mean you should get out there and start doing the various things, right? You should be able to be trusted as you gain more wisdom and more power, right? But you see some spiritual vagabonds, people who understand spiritual things, and they lord that information over people taking your money and stuff. You shouldn't do that. There's less restrictions on you up there. You can probably pay for that somewhere down the line, although the, those in the physical can't necessarily see that, don't understand what you're doing. They don't know, but you know what you should do right and be righteous because you do know and you have the freedom to do whatever you want to really, but 
you should always choose to do what's right, right? Listen, residents of a more constrained reality cannot comprehend a less constrained reality because it lies beyond the limits of their normal perception. Each dimension of reality has its own rules that define its objective science. Additionally, each dimension of reality experiences the next higher, less limited dimensions as subjective and mystical. Consequently, your mysticism may be another's science. Ooh, that is going to be our title for the day. I love that. Your mysticism may be another's science. Things that I used to think were magic and were mystical and of the devil, I now understand. Okay, consequently, your mysticism may be another's science. It depends on how big a picture you live and work in and the degree to which constraints limit your perception. The perspective from the next higher dimension provides a bigger picture with a more complete understanding. This more comprehensive, complete, and less restrictive knowledge is only accessible to lower dimensional beings, those with a more constrained awareness, through the experience of their individually locally subjective mind consequently a mystic could be a scientist from a higher dimension or a delusional fool hopelessly caught in a distorted web of belief how do you know which is which a good question we will go through the differentiating process in great detail in section three especially chapter 14 in book two First, read Flatland to help you appreciate the problem of understanding higher dimensions. Second, carefully and scientifically gather your experience as you progress step by step along your path toward increasing the quality and capability of your mind, consciousness, or being. Then simply taste the pudding to separate the wise from the foolish. If you can't tell a high if you can't tell a high quality consciousness that is wise and loving from one that is not you have uneducated taste buds and cannot correctly interpret your ex your experience repeat step two as often as necessary to some extent it takes one to know one you may need to develop evolve your consciousness before you get good at discrimination or what we would call in the church uh um, um, darn it. I had it right there. Um, um, start with a D discernment, discernment. If you can't tell a high quality consciousness that is wise and loving from one that is not, you have uneducated taste buds and cannot correctly interpret your experience. Repeat step two as often as necessary. To some extent, it takes one to know one, and you may need to develop, evolve your consciousness before you get good at discrimination or discernment, like the church say. The notion of local realities within separate dimensions of a hierarchy of dimensional existences is probably a different concept to grasp. Have patience. The seed has been planted, and later we will learn where these dimensions come from, what they mean, how they are created, and what love, wisdom, and physics could possibly have to do with any of it. And that, my beautiful people, <clears throat> is all of our reading for today. That was the rest of chapter 20 of My Big Toe. We read tablet 11 of the Lost Book of Inky. Y'all, it's Friday. T-G-I-F. Thank God it's Friday. It is February 11, 2022. Day 28 of year four of reading through the books of the law and the prophets. Another four year consecutive day count. Day 1046. All right, y'all. <clears throat> That's it. I'm going to share the Flatland link. And I said I was going to share something else. What did I say I was going to share? Or was that it? Hold on. Oh, the link for um, um, the Anunnaki Bible. Somebody, y'all, I, I know a few people already have it because I mentioned it before. But I, um, <clears throat> I put the links in there again. All right, y'all. So with that being said, I ain't calling Bella today. She already in kind of a mood. She doing the most this morning. 
and she upstairs. So we're just gonna go ahead and do this. We had an hour and 22 minutes, so let me minimize this. Bring up the blessing. Anybody, I know a couple people have already. Anybody um started going through the gateway process? Y'all worked up enough nerve to go through it? I know Jen had a good experience. Yay, Jen! My mom has went through it. I'm not through the whole thing, but they, they're starting to go through it. And they're getting good results. I was just curious if anybody else had taken a plunge or the leap to check it out yet. And it'll be um <clears throat> it'll be in the description box of all the videos while we're reading through my big toe. Just look for gateway process or whatever. Remember when we we're reading the CIA document. It's probably good too, as you're going through the different waves, it's probably good to go back to that CIA document just for like a quick summation of what the different waves are and what they do. Um, if you want to just glance over that again, you can um, see it. it's towards the end. Yeah, the last few pages, it goes through the different um, gateways, which one, you know, they, they identify what's going on in each gateway, in each gateway wave. All right, I'm getting tongue tied. All right, y'all doing another one after this. It's going to help develop your big toe. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really, really good. It's really good while we're realizing that we've been peddled a bunch of garbage, how they really toy with this Bible that we've come to love so much as we're transitioning from lies to the truth, right? It's going to help us <clears throat> in our in our ability to discern what is true and what is not, right? What is error? What is just simply feel-good stories, all this stuff, right? It's going to help develop that. Because those things we can simply just read about. We may or may not be able to find evidence of these things. Like we clearly know we have evidence of the pyramids, right? We clearly have evidence of the pyramids um, and a lot of other things. But some things we don't. But some things I don't think we're really going to understand if we don't tap into non-physical matter reality or tap into the spiritual realm or yeah. I mean, because... How many people have asked what these things are for and maybe not have gotten straight answers? Maybe you're just not developed enough where you can understand what's really going on. I don't know. But I figure if we develop our big toe and we under, and we uh, expand our understanding of spiritual things, we get pretty close. If not spot on to what's going on and what this world is that we're living in. And I still truly believe that this is a that earth is a training camp for the gods or if you don't like that word for the spirits right these we we're, we're, we're given these vehicles our spirits are put into these vehicles to help us develop and grow our spirits right because it's not well these bodies will develop and grow on their own if they're not impeded or if you don't kill it early right you you give it the premium gas the right food so it can grow that way you have you you your spirit has a really good vehicle to drive around in, right? You could drive around in a Bentley or you can drive around in a little putt putt. And depending on what you put or the type of gas you put in your car or the food you put in your mouth will determine the quality of your vehicle. Whether you're going to get a putt putt and we don't know if you're going to make it today or you might last to tomorrow. Or man, you look 80 years old. Oh my gosh, you don't look a day over 35. That's how I want to be. Like sis, you how old? A hundred sis, you don't look a day over 40. Those, those, those are my thoughts. That's what, you know, I'm just saying. So I'm restoring this uh this body. I'm 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 giving it upgrades and stuff, right? Are oh, you welcome, Big Wheel Warrior? You're gonna do one before you head out. Hey, y'all let me know. Let me know what's going on. How y'all developing and stuff. I'm doing it too. Right. So I'll be doing one. Um well, not right now. Um, I had to do it later. I gotta do mine towards the evening, like bedtime after the whole house gets settled down to work and all that stuff is done. So I get my I do mine, you know, during the evening time. So but yeah. But all right, y'all. That's it. So let's go ahead and uh do this blessing and get out of here. 
The blessing is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise, ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Yahuwah will kneel before us, presenting gifts, and will guard us with the hedge of protection. Yahuwah will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards us, bringing order, and he will provide us with sustenance, love, and friendship. Yahuwah will lift up his wholeness of being and look upon us, and he will set in place all we need to be whole and complete. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. All right, beautiful people. Love y'all. I see y'all back here tomorrow morning, 15 minutes later, 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Bruce. Oh, 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 yeah. Big Will Warrior. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Also, y'all, very key. Also, Big Will Warrior said, also remember, please hydrate before and after every meditation. Let me tell you something. When I first started meditating, I was further. This is when I first started, before I started growing my big toe. And I couldn't understand why it seemed like I, was, I felt dehydrated. My mouth was dry. I mean, I literally felt like I had cotton mouth when I would, uh, like if I would, if I would fall asleep meditating after meditating, why I would seem so dry. And then because I didn't understand what was happening, right? I, I just kind of clicked back over into church mindset. This is of the devil and all this. And I'm thinking the devil trying to suck my life out of me, right? I know this sounds stupid nowadays to those that understand, but I'm glad you brought it up because what's happening is. You know how you work out and you have to hydrate your physical body? Y'all, the same thing is happening with your spirit. You have if you are if you're if you spend the night astral projecting or having out of body experiences, your by although your body is laying there, your body is still feeling the effects just like you were out running around physically. That's why your body feels like whoo, I'm out of breath like it, it literally, what you're doing in the spirit will literally happen to your physical body. So if you're out riding around, running around, exploring and doing all this type of stuff, whether you dream or meditation or um, astral projecting, out of body experiences, <clears throat> you will find out that you are extremely thirsty. You have to hydrate. That is really good. I completely forgot about that. I mean, I just do because I keep water by my bed. I literally keep two bottles of water by my bed. And every time I wake up before I go to sleep, I drink some. I drink at least half the bottle. Because when I figured that out, um, I started looking. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't being spooky scary. And I found out I was being spooky scary. And I just didn't understand what was happening. <laughs> you couldn't sleep last night after you tried. I think it was my headphones. No. Try some, try some different headphones, uh, no. Trina. Yes. A nice green jar. Just a on me. Also, Trina, you got another thing going. I forgot. Um, you welcome, Jen. She said thanks for the info. Pause that for a second. I'm gonna tell you why you couldn't sleep, Trina. Um, but yeah. So remember, hydrate y'all before y'all meditate and all that. You know, because your body is literally getting a workout. Mm -hmm. And some when you when you learn how to do things mentally. And you learn how to like operate, girl, operate from your conscious. You will realize that when your body starts having these physical effects, you will begin to realize what some people say that, um, like, if you can conceive it or like, if you believe it, you can conceive it. It all goes along with that type of thinking. Your mind cannot tell if something is real or fake. Which is why if you constantly rehearse things over in your mind, whether it's good or evil, it will begin to manifest. Look, girl, get down. Go to bed. Go to bed. Get up. Hold on, y'all. Don't start. I told you, don't help me, little girl. It'll begin to manifest, right? And you have to be careful, all, especially if, you, um, if you're operating in a metaverse. I could care less good, bad. If you using it the wrong way, you can get poor results. If you're using it a good way, you can get good results. People that play video games and stuff, and especially with the, the VR headsets, 
while you're playing these games, you will have your body will react like you're playing it real time because your mind cannot tell the difference. So you have to be careful. I really begin to understand this. You really have to be careful what you allow to go in your eye gates and your ear gates and what you think about because the way our minds are designed to be operated by a spirit, they will begin to develop what you put in there whatever you put before it it will develop it and everything that goes in there it will take as 100 percent true which is why a lot of people get steeped in religious dogma and beliefs even if it's a complete farce because your mind is designed to take in information like it's 100 percent true so until you learn how to operate your mind and on purpose put in different types of information you might just have poor results, right? This is just it's just the way the mind was made. <clears throat> and I think my big toe I helped clear out a lot of that stuff. So hydrate your body before you go to sleep. Trina, you're fasting. When you're fasting and you're not taking in food, you require a lot less sleep. So it you couldn't it's not that you couldn't sleep after you did it because of the meditation. It's because you don't need to sleep. Like your the only reason you need to sleep is to restore and to break down the food that you put in your body <clears throat> and it assimilates it, right? You'll realize if you're fasting, especially if you're doing a longer fast like you do, like you're doing, you're only gonna need about four, maybe five hours of sleep. I was um when I did my 40 day fast, when I got about to that day where you're at, around about day I say nine to ten, you require a lot less sleep. But you become, you don't lose energy. You actually gain more energy. You're you're full of energy. And you could literally work all day and still be full of energy and still get like three to four, possibly five hours of sleep if your body will let you sleep that long. And, and you'll be like, and it's like you won't miss a beat. You become sharper. You become clear. That's just what happens, you know. So um, fasting used to be a well life for all, but we kind of lost that here in the Western world with convenience of everything and fast food on every corner now we can just order the food to our house right it's getting us further and further away from what we were originally um designed to do to help us grow and develop um in a healthy pace so it would do us all well to take up the lifestyle of fasting not only will it restore your health it'll cause you to grow spiritually a whole lot faster right so um, but yeah, so that's why you couldn't sleep, Trina. You're fasting. So and you're what? You on day 12 now? You on day 12, 11, 12, something like that. If I remember. But yeah, but keep going through with the process. Uh, write down your results. Keep track of it. All right, y'all. So with that being said, uh, that's it. Stay hydrated. Don't think you get insomnia. I'm, I'm, I'm actually part of a couple of fasting groups, and they talk about they get insomnia when they fast and they don't like that. I'm like, oh, my gosh, y'all, this is day 11. Okay, congratulations. And they, they, they think it's a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing. It's actually a natural part of it. And um, I put in there, I was like, guys, y'all need to look into this. It's not a bad thing. Your body is not requiring that much sleep. And I learned that while I was fasting because I consumed so many fasting lectures and looked up different things and how the body works. I'm like, oh, so this, because I was concerned about it at first. So I started looking. So I was like, oh, okay. That's okay. I understand it now. So also, if you look up some gurus, older gurus, ancient sages and stuff, they rarely sleep. They rarely sleep over four hours a night. They, they they don't need to. Their body does not require it. And they're also aging in reverse, right? It, it's something to it. You know, so. But, yeah, so that that's why. So. But, all right, y'all, that's it. Let me go and get out of here. I love y'all. I'll see y'all back here in the morning, 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Peace. Again.